Thank you. All right. Well, if you got a Bible, you could turn to Matthew chapter 6. Um, we're going to spend some time there. I want to pop up our um, spiritual practices slides, just kind of remind us where we are and what we're doing. We're talking about the things that help us in our spiritual formation, which is going from less Christ-like to more Christ-like. And these have been proven practices throughout really the whole of, um, of, of time, Old Testament and New Testament, but in particular throughout church history, um, our spiritual fathers and mothers have, have wrote about these things. And they're not guaranteed. Again, God is not some sort of genie in a lamp where you rub and you make wishes and you get what you want. Um, but these are practices that are proven to, to be helpful. Uh, stillness, we talked about last week, the ruthless elimination of hurry in our lives, um, Sabbath and silence and solitude. And, to, and today we're going to be talking about prayer. So you can keep those in mind as we work our way through. So prayer. Prayer. Um, Prayer to me is part of um, the grounded life. We talked about stillness as being part of the, the slow life, um, trying to find our, our, ourselves to slowing down and catching the rhythms of God's grace. Um, a lot of times we're way out ahead of God or we're way more excited about God. And it's true that some of us fall behind God and, 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 and don't really go with him, but we're trying to stay in step and stride with God. Um, and today we're talking about the grounded life where prayer really helps kind of get our roots into God. The prayer really helps us to get um, aligned with God. And so some of the the, the things that I've put under prayer here is um, just like we talked about, uh, stillness was the ruthless elimination of hurry. Um, Ron, Ronald Walheiser defined prayer as relaxing into God's goodness. And so as we come talk about prayer, I want us to think about those. The grounded life, the aligned life, it's relaxing into God's goodness. Well, there's prayers that are confessional. There's prayers that are contemplative. There's prayers that are prophetic an intercessory, there's prayers of thanksgiving, and there's prayers of lament. So all of those you see in the scriptures, and that means that in our lives, we should all be practicing each one of these types of prayers. All of them count. All of them are good and beautiful um, and right before the Lord. And uh, there's lots of text techniques to prayer. We're not going to get into that today. Um, again, that book from Brandon Cook, The Learning to Live and Love Like Jesus, is a, is a good book if you're wanting to get really in-depth um, on each, each of these things. But uh, techniques of prayer are, are obviously like in the closet. Jesus taught us to go into our closet or place of solitude. Um, there's journaling. Journaling's been a very helpful prayer practice for me. I, I write my prayers in a journal. Uh, it just keeps my mind focused and helps me to track that way. Um, some of you might have heard of the prayer of examine. This is something that I've been practicing recently. Actually, I picked it up in our uh, fasting and prayer season in January. And that's basically where you just kind of, at the end of the day, you just remember back over your day and, and all the moments. Like, you know, I got up and dro drove the kids to, to, to school, and I'll just kind of say a prayer for that. And then I, you know, went to my first meeting and, and I'll say a prayer for that. And just kind of going through your day and all the different moments of your day, you're just once again saying, okay, God, um, I'm praying this for that. I want to know what your perspective on that was, checking in with the Lord. Um, there's public prayer, there's private prayer, and then sometimes there's this idea of a liturgy of prayer. I was listening to um, a podcast and this, prayer, this pastor was talking about his um, lit liturgy of prayer, basically every day what he um, does as a practice of prayer. And I thought it was interesting. He said in the morning, he spends time in a lot more kind of intimacy with God prayer, is what he called it, kind of personal prayer. What am I dealing with? What am I facing? And, and kind of sharing those things with God. And then at some point in the middle of the day, um, he actually, for his lunch hour or whatever, he'll just go walk around wherever he is. So if he's at the office, he'll go walk around the office. If he's at home, he'll walk around his home. And he uses that as a real time of um, kind of like, what do you call it, like missional prayer. Um, or just kind of praying for other people. And then at the end of the day, um, he, he spends time just really doing intercessory prayer. So now that he's met all these people, and, and, and he'd, so instead of trying to pray for everybody everywhere, he'll just kind of focus in on, well, who should I pray for today that I interacted with? And, and, and he doesn't get overwhelmed that way with all the people that he should be praying for, if you, so to speak. And I thought that was kind of just a healthy practice. But all of us should be developing this lifestyle of prayer um, Dallas Willard, who I'm trying to introduce us to as someone who's going to be teaching us over this next year, uh, he has a quote, and he says this about prayer. He says, don't seek to develop a prayer life. 
Seek a praying life. A prayer life is a segmented time for prayer, and you'll end up feeling guilty that you don't spend more time in prayer. Eventually, you'll probably feel defeated and maybe even give up. But a praying life is a life that is saturated with prayerfulness. You seek to do all that you do with the Lord. Just trying to connect with the Lord in all of these things. And so if you missed it, you know, I didn't pray this morning, therefore I can't pray the rest of the day. I mean, it's funny, but that's what our minds kind of do. I missed my prayer time. It's like, don't think of it like that. Don't think of it like that. Or I didn't have a good prayer time. It's not about that. It's basically just kind of to seek the awareness of the Lord all the time there. And and anytime you need to, you can turn. He's just one step away. He's one thought away um, from a time of prayer. So anyways, let's look at Jesus, who is our example in everything. Um, And one thing I need to remind us, and uh, if you want to have a theological discussion about this afterwards, I'm totally fine with that. Um, I, I actually enjoy that. Um, even in email form. It's kind of fun. But um, Jesus was God incarnate, no doubt about it. He was fully God, 100%, and fully man, fully human, which is really tough for our brains to get around. That's 200%. But that's the, the, the miracle and, and the mystery of the incarnation. But what that means is that Jesus, when he came here, he was fully God, clothed in full humanity. And so what what that also means is that when Jesus was here, though he had all of his God powers, he never once used any of them. So when we read about Jesus, we're reading about someone who was human. Not someone who, as we would say, cheated. (laughs) When he faced temptation, he did not face temptation with his deistic powers. He faced temptation in the exact same way that you and I do and are capable of. When he walked around and healed people, that was not Jesus using his deistic powers. That was Jesus cooperating with the spirit of the Father that was with him and bringing about those things into humanity. Jesus was just like you and I. The example he gave us is what we are supposed to live into. He never used any of his God powers. That's why at that one point he said, hey, if I wanted to, I could call down you know, thousands of angels and they would come set me free right now. However, I am not going to do that because he wanted to be able to be in touch with our affirmities, with our challenges, so that he could be our high priest and knows what we're going through. So I say that as we're about to look into Jesus's life, and we're going to look three quick examples, three quick stories, one where Jesus is teaching his disciples to pray, one where Jesus is actually praying for his disciples, and one where Jesus is praying because he's going through a personal struggle in his life. So Matthew chapter 6, let's jump into here real quick. Matthew chapter 6, verse 5. Jesus is teaching on prayer, and he says, when you pray, he's actually teaching on spiritual practices, but prayer is one of them. He says, when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues or on the street corners to be seen by others, like those pastors, like that David guy. He's always praying in front of everybody. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray... Go into your room, close the door, and pray to your father. Your father. Now, this is very different from what people had said. I mean, there was a great reverence of God, but Jesus is calling him father. He's saying, you have access to God. You don't have to go to the synagogue to have access to your father. You don't have to go through a priest to have access to your father. This is radical. We're so familiar with it, but this is radical stuff Jesus is saying, offensive stuff to the priests and to the synagogal order. Then your father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep babbling like the pagans and pastor preacher people, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them. And catch this, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. So as you come to a prayer time, You're supposed to remember that God already knows what you need. 
before you even ask him. And he says, this then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, holy is your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also for have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And what I want you to catch here is just this whole concept that when Jesus is saying, teaching his disciples how to pray, he's saying, don't make this about your needs. And it's not that God doesn't care about your needs. It's saying God actually knows what you need before you even ask. God's already there. But when you come to pray, you need to, to kind of sp spend your time in prayer more remembering who God is, that he's your father, that he's holy and mighty. And you need to find yourself praying that your life, your will, your world will come in alignment with God's will, God's kingdom. That's what prayer really is all about. It's trying to get our will to line up with God's will. And it's not a denial of your needs, but it's really getting the same list that God has of your needs. <laughs> God, I need this, 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 and this. And he's like, well, you need this. And maybe it's on your list. Maybe it's not even on your list. And the goal of prayer is to get the same list that God has for you to be in your own heart and on your own list. Does that make sense? So it's kind of that kind of prayer. So then John 17, Jesus is now, you know, right before going to the cross, right after the Last Supper. And it's amazing because John records this long prayer that Jesus played. We're not going to get into all of it. I just want to pick up on this first part. In John 17, it says, after Jesus said this, he looked toward heaven and prayed, Father. Again, there you have this Father idea. The hour has come. Glorify your Son that your Son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all the people that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. So here's Jesus praying. And basically, there's a couple things I want you to pick up here. He knows the Father knows what he needs. And so he comes to the Father and he says to him, Father, I know you're there. I know you're close. I know you care about me and what's going on in my life. And then he says, the hour has come. Now, the, what that means is that Jesus has already talked to the Father, already heard from the Father, already knows the will of the Father for that moment of his life. And that's why he's been able to tell his disciples, hey, we need to have this Passover in a real special way. I need to pass on this kind of communion aspect of my body and my blood. I need you to get, understand that, that the time is coming very soon where I will be gone from you. And if you read John 14, 15, and 16, Jesus is doing a lot of that kind of final teaching, final work with his disciples. So here he knows that when he comes to this prayer time in John 17, he and the Father have been communing so much so he already knows what's supposed to happen in that moment. He already knows the will of the Father. And so he says, the hour has come. God, you and I both know that it's time. And not only that, but he says, for you have granted me, him authority over all people that he might give eternal life to those you again. So he knows the purpose to which he even came. So he knows the timing, but he also knows what God's will was for his life. And he knows that he's accomplished it. Because he had been praying, not about his needs, but praying to get God's list for his life. So much so that he could come confidently at this night before his greatest trial, his greatest pain, the cross, and said, okay, Father, I know it's time. I know your will for me. I've accomplished it, and I know this next phase is going to be hard. And then he says that I have finished the work you gave me to do. He knew that it was completed. 
except for the one last thing. And so now let's jump on to Matthew 26, where we're going to, you know, we read this last week, but I want to read it again on prayer. It says in Matthew 26, 36, Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to them, Sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. So let's say you have good prayer times. You know the will of God. You know the timing. You're totally dialed in. You know you've accomplished what the Lord wants you to do. You know you're in good standing with God. Does that mean you won't go through sorrowful and hard moments? No, because sometimes the will of God for your life is so far against the will that you would have for your life. And Jesus is in that moment. Though he has never sinned, though he is totally in tune with the Father, he's now in this moment where he has prayers of lament, prayers of confession, prayers of pain and sorrow. And he goes a little further and he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, my father, if it's possible, may this cup be taken from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. And when we read that, a lot of times we think that's easy for Jesus. But no, Jesus knew the will of the Father. He knew the time had come. But now that the night is getting on more, now that the reality of the cross is becoming more and more in picture, Jesus, who is fully human, pleads with his Father and says, if there's any other way, please don't make me drink this cup. Jesus' will, the core of his being, was struggling to get in alignment with the will of his Father. His humanity was crying out, no, just like yours and I's does. Yours and I's. I'm preaching. I'm not writing. <laughs> and all of us have been in that moment where our will, our flesh, our core, something inside of us is chafing, is creating great friction between our will and the will of the Father. And for some of us, it happens every day. And here's Jesus in that same place. And his prayer is, I don't want to do this. I'm asking that you find another way. Yet he surrenders and says, not my will, but your will. And then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Couldn't you keep watch with me for one hour, he asked Peter. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And he went away a second time and said, my father... If it's not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. So basically, Jesus is no, he's realizing that the answer has come. The Lord is not answering his plea for another way. But his Father, in his silence, is answering that this is the way. And Jesus with, musters up a little more resolve and says, your will be done. And then it says he went back to find the disciples sleeping again, and then he came back once again, and he prayed the third time saying the same thing. Prayed three times. And after the third time, he didn't need to pray anymore about that. It's kind of like when Paul, remember Paul was praying that God would take away the thorn in his flesh. We don't know what that was, but that's the way he described it. There was something in his life, whether it was a physical ailment, whether there was some sort of like temptation thing, whether it was some sort of, you know, um, kind of more like mental or, or, uh, or emotional thing he had. And he prayed three times that God would remove it. 
And he said that the Lord came and answered him and said, Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. In your weakness, my strength is going to be found. And so that was an answer to Paul. But he did not get healed. He did not get what he was hoping for, but he got answered. And he was done with that after three times of prayer. He, at that point, knew the will of God, and he allowed his will to conform to it. Conform to it. And even in that moment, the the idea of relaxing into God's goodness. Somehow he, Paul, believed and understood and walked in this reality that the healing would not have been as good as what God was going to do without healing him. That's a hard thing for us to swallow. But God was basically saying, Paul, you're going to experience my grace more if you continue to walk with this thorn in the flesh than if I was to heal you right now. And when we look at Paul's life, we see a life full of grace. We see a life so strong and powerful, though Paul described himself many times as weak because God came through. Now, real quick, Before we move on to just kind of some final thoughts, I want to talk to you about prayer and the reality of all these different types of prayer. So we had these prayer nights in January. We had three prayer nights. And like I said, it was probably the most eclectic group of prayer nights you've ever seen at one church. Uh, The first night was very kind of personal, and and, uh, there was prayers of repentance, prayers of giving forgiveness, um, kind of that type of deal. And then the second night was was more prayers that were kind of a little more courageous, um, took a little more courage uh, to speak out prayer and to receive prayer. And then the last night was a lot more contemplative, where we were in the gym and we were kind of sitting around stations and and, and just kind of thinking inwardly about what God was saying to us in these different areas. And it was a wonderful grouping of prayer nights. And I just want to tell you about that, the middle one, because the middle one I really was processing for a long time afterwards, because it did take courage, and it did um, cause all of us to a little bit step out of ourselves, step out of what is comfortable. And uh, that night, there was a guy, Kurt, who's a pastor here. Kurt was praying for that night and felt like God had spoken to him that he was going to heal some people that night. And so we're like, okay, awesome. Hope it's the Lord, you know, like, (laughs) hope it is. And so Kurt got up here and he said, okay, I've been praying and I feel like God told me there's some people with some elbows and some knees and some bags. I forget all he was saying. And so people courageously stood up in those moments and were like, okay, well, I could use a little bit of that right here, a little bit of that right here. Um, And and, and it it was interesting because, you know, there was probably like 30 or 40 people that stood up. And I was like, whoa, that's courageous, standing up in church. That's a lot. Oh, okay. And I was getting a little nervous. And then Kurt was like, okay, now we'll have people gather around him and we're going to pray three times. Jesus prayed three times. Paul prayed three times. We're going to pray three times for these people to receive these healings that Paul, I mean, that Kurt already spent time with the Father and already felt like the Father had said, yeah, I'm going to do this for some people that night. And so Kurt's like, okay, God already said, let's do it, so let's walk in. And we're all like, okay, we're walking in this, you know? And, and those people stood up. And then we prayed, and, and then after the third time, um, Kurt was like, who got healed? And there was about four hands that went up, something like that. And, and, and no, that was it. And so we, we kind of walked away from the night going, okay. Well, and I mean, I think we kind of ran out of time. So it was like, okay, what just happened? And I've been processing it. And for me, I'm super like skeptical, maybe critical. I don't know what it is, but I was like, okay. So there were people that, that raised their hand that got healed. So I like, hunted them down, not in a creepy way. Um, <laughs> at least I didn't feel like it was creepy. Um, and, and, I, and I got their stories. And uh, one of them was he, he got healed of an ankle problem. He said his ankles had been a problem off and on for years, but really bad in the last two months. That night he was prayed for and tried moving them around. He felt some popping and they started feeling good. What used to hurt was not hurting anymore. And he was actually walking with a cane during that time. And it's been over three weeks now and they're still feeling good. He said that that this healing had been a new addition to his relationship with God. He felt like God had said that no to a lot of his prayers, but this yes helped him know God is with him and he's on the right track of following him. It was like a new jumpstart in his desire to pursue God. 
And it was like, yeah, that was awesome. And then another guy I talked to, he had an elbow pain. And for months, he had elbow pain. He couldn't work out or do a push-up. He couldn't straighten it out. That's a big deal for a man, by the way. You can't do a push-up. It's just like, man card is gone. You don't know where it is. Um, but he couldn't straighten it out. That night, that, that night, this guy has real faith. That night, after he felt like God healed him, he was able to stretch it the whole way. After service, which were over at like 8.30, he went to the gym to work out. And it was perfect. He was shocked. He did like a million push-ups. No, he didn't do it. Um, he didn't expect it. It had only been on that spot. He only kind of felt, felt like God healed him like that back in 2010 um, with his knee. But it made him trust Jesus more. And it was a check in his spirit to pray more often. And then there was a guy with a neck pain that, that got healed and, and he, was, he was totally, you know, something he'd been struggling with for 10 years. And it was, a, it was a degenerative disc in his neck and he hasn't had any pain at all. He said he was getting headaches every day and he hasn't had a headache since that night of healing. And he is just so pumped up and thanking Jesus for loving us all. And then I talked to a couple other people that I knew there. And one of them was like, you know, he, he actually, I knew he had a torn ACL. And he, was, he, had, he had it that week. He, got, he tore his ACL. And so when, when Kurt was like, I think somebody with knee, I was like, uh-oh, he's going to have to stand up. And he didn't stand up. And I was like, what's up, man? He's just standing up. But he told me afterwards that he was just, it was like this really challenging moment for him. And he felt like the Lord said, hey, I got you. I got you. You don't need to stand up. And, and what it was was because he had scheduled a surgery and he was nervous about the surgery, but he felt like in that moment God spoke to him and said to him, hey, the surgery is the route for you and it's going to be good. And it's funny because I know this guy, I know God's always trying to slow him down. So I was kind of like, yeah, I could see God doing that to you, you know? And then somebody else, the same thing. They, they got healed that night and the next day they woke up and it was like four times worse. And they were like, what am I doing wrong? But because of that, they ended up saying, maybe I just need to go to the doctor. They went to the doctor and found out that they were actually having something that needed to have surgery pretty quick or else it was going to cause some major paralysis. And so they kind of said, well, God did lead through that night and got me to where I needed to be. So God works in all these different ways. So it's not a matter of God just healing you. It's finding out what God wants to do in your life. This is what prayer is all about. And I'm so thankful for a guy like Kurt that will kind of say, I hear the Lord saying these things and trying to help us all get into them. But just because one person does it doesn't mean it's the same thing for everybody. And for me, in conclusion, this has been a, a lesson that God's taught me a lot because um, my mom, I remember when she was diagnosed with cancer and was in the final stages, um, it had metastasized to her brain and uh, I went up to go be with her and, and my mom, she's awesome in a million ways. And, and I remember talking to her um, briefly before she kind of finally went into full um, where she was just kind of medicated and hospice and all of that. And I was just telling her, I was like, Mom, because she, she prayed and she knew God very well. And I was like, can you tell me what God's telling you right now? Because he's not telling me much, <laughs> or at least I can't hear very well. And she said that um, she felt like God, she was praying about her healing and God uh, told her that, and I'll, I'll never forget these words, but he said, my, my power is over you to heal you. And when she said that to me, it was, it was just this idea that God was just, his power was just coursing all over her and to heal her. And I, 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 my heart leapt a little bit and I thought, was, does that mean he's going to heal you? And she said, no, no, that doesn't mean he's going to heal me. But what it meant to my mom when she explained it to me was that God's very close, he's very present, and he could heal her in an instant. However, he was asking her to trust him, that he had something better. And it had given her a lot of peace. And she died very peacefully. And it did give me peace over time, you know. To know that she had that assurance in prayer, that she had the will of God, and it was sustaining her through that time, just like Jesus as he went to the cross. And then it became even more real for me when uh, my own daughter was diagnosed while she was still in utero um, with spina bifida. And they were telling us all the, the horrible things that, that were coming. And, uh, and so I remember praying to God in that moment and saying, okay, Lord, it's time for me to learn how to pray. <laughs> and, 
and I prayed that God would heal her. And, and it felt like my prayers were kind of like, you know, they just weren't like going very far. They were kind of weak prayers. And, and not that God was laughing at me, but he was smiling that way. <laughs> like, no, that's not, that's not a good prayer. And so I, I remember it took me about a few months and I, my prayer then came, okay, God, if, if, if you're wanting to do something, then I know that everything you do is for your glory. And, and so I pray that you would heal her, that, that you would heal her um, of this maybe after she's you know, born so that everyone really knows she had this, but then she's healed and everyone can see what you're doing and, and, uh, and you can get the glory. And I still felt like God was not very pleased with my prayer. And, um, and so I, I, I prayed again. I said, okay, Lord, um, I pray that maybe when she's a year old, you know, because that way she wouldn't be behind with walking and, and all of that. And, but everyone, it would be very clear and that wasn't good. And I said, well, maybe later on when she's like 10, you know, so that it can be this really amazing uh, thing that God has done. And, and, I, and I felt like God was telling me all along that I'm going to heal her, but I, I, I just need you to, to get in line with what I'm thinking. And it was funny because it wasn't until really about three months of just this kind of agonizing prayer that it dawned on me one day and I prayed this prayer. I prayed, God, I pray that you would heal Bella in the time that it's most significant for her relationship with you. And I felt like heaven opened. And I felt the pleasure of God on me. And I felt a deep, deep peace settle into my soul that has sustained me through 10 years of a beautiful life. That gets heavy sometimes. But the Lord's answer to my prayer, the Lord helping me figure out how to pray in the way that I was supposed to pray, has given me this prayer that now sustains me throughout the rest of my life. And I don't care. People say, can I pray for Bella? That should be hit. I'm like, sure, go for it. You know, uh, you never know what the Lord's going to do. Ma you know, marry Jesus' mom. He's like, Jesus, just make the wine. Turn that water into wine. And he's like, it's not my time, woman. And she's like, he's just, do, he's just do what he says. And she, he's like, ah, fine. And then he did it. So I'm like, sure, man, pray for her. We'll take any kind of prayer. Maybe the Lord will be like, ah, whatever. These people are annoying. I'll just give them what they want. <laughs> there's, some, there's some parables like that. But, but for me, I don't, it sounds weird, but I don't need to pray anymore about it. I'm settled. I really have become settled. Now, it doesn't mean I don't get unsettled and pray again, but, but, but I've, I've prayed this prayer that I know is in God's name. Ask anything in my name. Ask anything in my character, and it will be given. And I have prayed that God will heal Bella in the time it is most significant for her relationship with him, and I know God is going to answer that prayer because he's the one that taught me to pray it. And so in some ways, I just leave it alone now. And I just do my job, being her dad, loving her. Let's pray.